The world's newest nation, born less than eight years ago, has had a traumatic childhood. With unimaginable sexual violence and a death toll that rivals Syria, why has this country fallen out of the headlines? I'm Imran Garda and today's newsmaker is South Sudan. The day South Sudan became an independent nation was a moment of great hope for a better future. But since then, it's faced significant hardship. Rape has been rampant and hundreds of thousands of people have been killed. There was renewed optimism last year when President Salva Kiir and his political rival agreed to end the conflict. But did it work? Well, the UN says there has been a dramatic drop in violence. Yet, civil war still rages on and abuses are still commonplace. So it's hardly surprising that millions have been forced to flee in search of safety. And for millions more still in South Sudan, they're in desperate need of assistance. So why has the country almost completely fallen out of the news? Haider Abbasi takes a look. After five years of war, they finally struck a deal to bring peace. Sworn enemies were at last smiling at each other. We must be honest and admit that the internal war we as Southerners, as South Sudanese, are engaged in for the last five years is definitely senseless. But has this agreement been enough to end the atrocities in South Sudan? According to the United Nations, no. And the abuses are still being carried out. Back in September, one of the rebel leaders refused to sign the peace deal. Thomas Carrillo was once a general in South Sudan's military, but he defected in 2017. His group of rebels still carry out attacks. The UN says large numbers of women and girls have been raped. Victims and witnesses describe how the SPLA and aligned forces would storm into villages in the early morning around dawn, surround the village and start shooting at fleeing civilians. The attackers would then steal cattle, loot entire households and burn down houses and food stocks. Experts warn that the peace deal is in danger of collapsing. South Sudan broke away from Sudan in 2011. But after decades of fighting for independence, the people of South Sudan turned their guns on themselves. In 2013, President Salva Kiir fired his deputy, Riek Mashar. Fighting broke out between the forces loyal to both men. But what began as political violence soon developed into a conflict between tribes. Kiir belongs to the Dinka and his rival Mashar is from the Nuwa. A recent report by the U.S. State Department says nearly 385,000 people have now been killed in the civil war, and around 4 million have been driven from their homes. Both sides are accused of committing mass murder, rape, and arson. It's one of the world's most serious humanitarian crises, yet receives little international attention. As part of the peace deal, Riyak Mishal will return from exile as South Sudan's vice president. But after five years of a war between rival communities, will this help to calm the hostilities? Haider Abbasi, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined now from Juba by South Sudan's presidential spokesman, Ateni Wek Ateni. Also in Juba is Reverend James Ninru, the executive director of the NGO Assistance Mission for Africa. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. James, let me start with you. Thank you. There's a peace deal. We have the UN envoy, David Shearer, saying fighting has diminished greatly and he is encouraged by a number of positive things. Do you agree with that? Yes, I think I agree. Because if we compare this month, last year, uh, with this time, there's a great difference. Uh, first of all, the gun has not gone silent, but it has reduced uh, totally into just a spotlight in some places. Right. Ateni Wekateni, good to have you on the program again. Now, Shera, when he was giving the figures, he said the number of people at UN sites to 
protect themselves, those who fled to these UN sites to flee violence and rape and so on, has dropped from 205,000 to 193,000. Now, for me, that looks like the UN envoy is a glass half full guy because both numbers are still hovering around the 200,000 mark. Is it good enough for you, Mr. Atene? Uh, in, in actual fact, um, whatever positive um, thing that happened is always appreciated, no matter how small is it. So uh, that is a significant uh, uh, drop in uh, the number of those who are actually seeking protections at the uh, UN protection sites. Uh, it, it is continued to be high, and we will work to ensure that, you know, uh, the people who are in the protection site comes out and, uh, and, and melt into a, a civil population, as it is their right as citizen of this country to be with their brothers and sisters outside in a state of just being um, a coach inside a camp that, that is called protection site. Atene, when will people finally be allowed to go home in safety? Give me a timeline. No, even now it's safe for them to be out. Uh, maybe some individual now wanted to continue simply because uh, UN protection side is still providing, uh, you know, uh, aid assistance and uh, food uh, to number of families that uh, might uh, not be secure outside, uh, you know, uh, food-wise, if they are to come out from the, the camp. So, so you, you mean, you see, see that, you know, there are people reluctant to go outside because there is something that will hunt them down as, you know, uh, the fighting has reduced um, in many places. With the exception of those small, you know, small, small pockets of uh, resistance that are still being, you know, witnessed around Equatoria. And, and that are the, the forces of, uh, of, uh, of Thomas Rillo. So, so the country is, in, you know, is, is better calmed. And, and it is safe for anybody to come outside from the protection side. James, I want to ask you a big quick picture question about the international interest in what's going on in South Sudan. When South Sudan decided to become an independent country, all eyes were on South Sudan, and you couldn't miss South Sudan when you looked at TV channels, when you looked at newspapers and so on. Now when we look at the death toll, solid independent figures coming out showing that the death toll over the civil war has been almost 400,000 people. That's Syria levels of deaths. And South Sudan has a much smaller population. <laughs> Yet despite that, there hasn't been a whole lot of media coverage of your country. Tell me why. The international community interest towards South Sudan has dropped simply because it has gone contrary to what was expected after the independence. The slogan that we uh, use when we were fighting the war is that we want to be liberated, we want to rule ourselves, we want to be in our own country. But after getting the independence, there were no formula that was put in place on how to achieve that big dream. Let's go to Nairobi now and bring in Saif Magango. He's Amnesty International's Deputy Regional Director for East Africa. Saif, do you agree with the premise that there isn't enough attention on South Sudan, even though civil war continues to rage? Well, it's actually a good thing that you, you asked that question, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's not uh, entirely true that South Sudan has... There's lack of interest in South Sudan. The whole world is trying to resolve the problems in South Sudan. But you can imagine there is a lot of frustration as a result of South Sudan's leadership failing to, uh, to hold people accountable, those who have committed crimes, um, grave crimes under international law, people who have, with victims still sitting in, in, in POC camps in Juba, Malakal, Bentu, and other places, and no clear plan being shown to, to try and um, hold those who put them in this situation, uh, uh, hold them to account, and for them to have justice and redress. Mm -hmm. You're showing pictures at the moment of people getting food aid from international organizations. That is evidence that the world is trying to support the people of, so, people of South Sudan. Mm -hmm. uh, the regional countries have tried to mediate 
uh, a peaceful resolution to the conflict. Uh, many, many agreements have been violated and killings have continued. Sexual violence has continued. Up to this day, we're still hearing stories of people, uh, people who have been displaced by violence, uh, suffering and not getting help. And we are hearing stories of even um, different sides uh, continuing to arm themselves and to recruit soldier fighters. So the world is trying to help, but it seems not to have a, a willing and a willing partner on the other right. side. Okay, so let's ask the presidential spokesman, Ateni Wekateni. Does the man have a point from Amnesty that there's a lack of accountability, especially since when we look at the crimes committed, major allegations, mass rapes, people being burnt alive, uh, mass killings, you know, on an unimaginable scale, sexual violence that is incomparable to anywhere else on the planet right now. It's not only Machar's forces or other dissident rebel groups and other offshoots, but also strong credible claims that the SSPDF are doing this as well, and there's no accountability for it. Uh, first of all, uh, to uh, begin with, as to why uh, South Sudan is not uh, on the news spot uh, after the civil war has actually started, uh, compared to uh, when it was gaining independence. Uh, the questions, uh, you know, poses itself as to, to, uh, to whether uh, the international community interest in South Sudan during the independence and the international community interest in South Sudan when the civil war erupted are different or are still, is, or, or they are still the same. Um, when you look at uh, uh, why South Sudan is not in the news, it is the international community to answer this. Because uh, uh, looking at me as, as also a victim, because I'm a victim of this war as a, as a, as a member of government of South Sudan. And, um, and, and if, if I tell you that uh, South Sudan is not in the news simply because of one, two, three, it might not be acceptable to you. But what, I, what I'm, I'm seeing on this is that um, uh, South Sudan has, has done well uh, uh, after the peace agreement has been signed and all the parties now seems to have accepted, you know, to uh, for a peaceful, uh, you know, resolution to the conflict, uh, uh, you know, with the exception of few individuals that are actually remaining outside the peace agreement. Uh, things are going to be better for South Sudan and I think South Sudan will go back to the international focus because right. uh, the same potential, potential that was seen to be, uh, you know, uh, existed in South Sudan uh, are going to come back since there is going to be uh, no war uh, in South Sudan. Okay, so At Ateni, let me, let me ask that question again. And I'm glad that you, you answered what was addressed a little bit earlier by the other guests. But I want to ask what I asked you specifically again with some statistics, right? So when we look at how this civil war has specifically affected women in South Sudan, South Sudan, 80% of the refugees and internally displaced people are women and children. 75% of girls are not enrolled in primary school. More than 50% are married before the age of 18. 58% of households reportedly female-headed. More than 19,000 children are estimated to have been recruited into armed groups, according to UNICEF, right? And we also have reports of the use of child soldiers, mass rapes, and indiscriminate attacks not only being done by the rebel groups, but also by the South Sudan People's Defense Force, the SSPDF, your government's forces. So I go again, and I look at how this is playing out for the people on the ground. Yes, there might be a peace deal amongst the two big figures that's relatively holding, and we're looking forward to Machar coming back, but on the ground, can you honestly tell me that South Sudan is a safe place, especially for its women and children, as the presidential spokesman? Yeah, uh, South Sudan is safe uh, more than any other time uh, since the start of war uh, in 2013. Um, you know, uh, when, when, when you look at, at any war, uh, the, 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 the much affected population is uh, the women and the children. There's no doubt about that. But when you, when you look at the way, you know, the news are covered uh, about South Sudan, uh, there is a bit of exaggeration on, on many things. Why would they yes, need to exaggerate? Yes, we do uh, acknowledge. 
Yeah, we need. To, I think there is an agenda that but, has not yet why, been actually found as to. But what is the agenda? Why would they need uh, to blame the government forces as well? Well, uh, uh, well, when you look at the way the news are covered, it is like much of the uh, the news me of the of the media agencies are just interested uh, when when it, when a case is about uh, something negative, but when it is positive thing that is done by the government, they don't they don't seem Certainly, to cover but, it. I mean, simply sir, because is, they are. It's clearly. It's clearly a problem when there's mass rapes and mass killings, and that's why we want to cover it, right? It's not that we're you know, just choosing you know, to cover you know, it. My, you know, mass... It overwhelms mass rape, and overrides a good news not, story, not, doesn't it? Mass, mass rape, mass rape is, not, is not true, because, you know, our culture in South Sudan uh, prohibited rapes. The UN there, and the yeah, US State Department have reported that all sides in the there conflict, be... including the National Army and the SSPDF, have yeah, used not... child soldiers. Mass rapes of I'm women not, and girls, indiscriminate it. attacks in Unity I'm State, not... April, May 2018. 125 women were raped, at least 125, in Bentiu in Unity State in November. The victim said they were armed men in military uniform. Now, we're not doing that with an agenda because we want to make you look bad. We're doing it because this is serious, right? And clearly, you don't want this to happen in your country, do you? You know, we are a country that actually emerged uh, from the uh, long uh, years of uh, civil war, that, that, that actually uh, a war of liberation that has culminated into the independence of the Republic of South Sudan. We were not given free of charge. And during the time we were fighting in the liberation, we even killed or, or even executed those who actually, uh, uh, actually uh, uh, raped women. I am not denying the fact that there are a few, you know, individuals who still take law into their own hand. But uh, should that thing comes to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to ask to know, we will take them to, to the book. Okay. Okay. But, but so, when you okay, look so at, at some of these uh, Okay, news, so you're saying there's accountability if it happens and when it happens, but it's happening on a smaller yeah, scale. Yeah, of course. Unfortunately, we've lost Reverend James Ninru. It's his Skype connection. He's dropped out. We don't have much time, so I want to bring in <coughs> Safe Magango. Safe, you've heard me converse now with Ateni Wek, Ateni, over the past few minutes. He's saying there is accountability and they're doing their best and things are moving forward. Do you agree with that? Well, no, no not at all. I think the only case we've seen where there's been some accountability is the terrain case where soldiers uh, broke into um, a hotel where uh, uh, aid workers were and raped them and killed a journalist. I think we had convictions in those cases last year. But beyond that, we haven't seen any tangible steps to, to bring people who are perpetrators of violence and human rights violations on a grand scale to court. Um, what is, and what we've seen instead has been an onslaught on people who are calling for justice, uh, human rights actors, human rights organizations, um, and, and other, uh, other dissidents, people who's, who are trying to call on the government to do the right thing. As we speak today, uh, you know the case of uh, Peter Biar, uh, a gentleman who ha was trying yes. to advocate for, uh, for responsible leadership, calling for a new generation of leaders and talking about, about accountability and all, all those kinds of things. He's now spent six months in detention. Right. Arbitrarily, he's not, he's not being brought to court. Okay. Uh, I, okay, so family, you know what, listen, this is a good point. Is. Safe. Let me allow, allow me to come in here, right? I'm going to ask my producer for extra time here because I think this is important. Atini Wekateni. So we have the case of Peter B.R. Ajak. Cambridge and Harvard educated, for those who want to know. Completed a PhD in politics at Trinity College in Cambridge. Imprisoned in South Sudan in July. He doesn't know why. His lawyer doesn't know why. They assume it's because of a tweet criticizing the government. It was in apparent retaliation for his activism on Twitter. Not been formally charged. Legal counsel reportedly been informed that he's accused of both terrorism and treason and being held in the Blue House at the head headquarters of the National Intelligence and Security Service. Apparently, that's a place where torture happens. Is the detention of Peter B.R. Ajak justified, sir? Uh, to be honest with you, so that, you know, say if uh, Maganga doesn't go away with uh, the fact that, you know, uh, during the terrain uh, incident, uh, soldiers were actually brought to book, and there are now people actually facing just facing uh, long terms, you know, uh, in jails. Um, 
he did not know that you know uh, the case was actually settled. Uh, it happened that when the individual soldiers took the you know the law into their own hand. Uh, coming to issue of Peter Biarajak, uh, Peter Ajak, Biarajak is now under investigation, and I cannot speak about the case that uh, is uh, under investigation. And uh, and South Sudan is a country that has laws and has uh, institution that um, uh, uh, you know. Uh, detained uh, people like any other country uh, pending, uh, so, you know, uh, okay, the, the investigation is it normal on the for case. You that, is it normal for you that he was detained in July? There's still no charge and no real access to the outside world. And the last thing he did was criticize the government on social media. Does that seem around that, about fair to you? That, that, that is assumption. Okay, I'm stating the facts just, because we don't know. You can just assume anything. Yeah. Certainly, I'm stating the you facts. You can just assume know. anything. You, you okay. cannot. You can just assume. Even in the, the Turkey, where you are, there are people locked up. More than hundred of thousand are in prison because of the the coup, that actually of the failed coup. So, so you you have not um, <laughs> uh, come to the point of uh, of of talking about uh, you know uh, you know uh, uh, you, you if you talk about the people that are. Okay. are I ask you about behind the gate. Okay, I there ask you about Peter Biar Ajak oh. detained without charge or trial, and you tell me about the failed coup said, from 2016. I said the case is okay. Under okay. Okay. The case is I, under I expected a, I, yeah, I expected a bit better, but all right. Listen, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It's uh, important to us to continue to cover South Sudan, and we will no doubt cover South Sudan again very soon. And I hope to have you back on the show, Ateni Wekateni and Safe Magango, and earlier Reverend James Nenru. Thanks so much for joining us. Still to come, Italy's leaders back France's Yellow Vest protesters. We ask why relations between Paris and Rome have soured so fast. And these men were found guilty of war crimes in Guatemala, but could they soon be set free? France and Italy have history. They're founding members of the EU and share close economic ties. But lately, things have taken a turn for the worse, especially since its new ruling coalition came to power in Rome. At the center of their fraught relationship right now is immigration. France criticized Italy for not allowing rescue boats carrying refugees to dock in its ports. But the Italians accused the French of impoverishing Africa for its own gain. But is this latest tit-for-tat really about immigration, or is there something else behind the spat? Sandra Gatman reports. There were concerns from the start that under new leadership, France and Italy's modern friendship could become strained. French President Emmanuel Macron is the pro-EU globalist establishment darling. Italy's deputy prime ministers Matteo Salvini and Luigi Di Maio are the nationalist, populist, Eurosceptic rebels. And now it seems the gloves are coming off. The fact that France is one of those countries that is stamping a money per 14 stati africani impedisce lo sviluppo di quegli stati africani e contribuisce alla partenza di profughi che poi muoiono nel Mediterraneo o arrivano sulle nostre coste. In misure di retorsion, la réponse è che la nostra intenzione non è di giocare al concours di celui che è il più bête. It began as a migration issue and an attack on France's colonial legacy in Africa, but soon morphed into a wider dispute. Salvini has taken the side of France's Yellow Vest demonstrators. They've been protesting against Macron's policies and confronting police. Perché sono vicino con tutto il cuore con il mio lavoro al popolo francese, a milioni di donne e uomini che vivono in Francia con un pessimo governo e con un pessimo presidente della Repubblica. Now even the art world has been caught up with some Italian politicians refusing to loan Leonardo da Vinci artworks to the Louvre Museum in Paris. There's speculation, too, about whether major projects can go ahead, like a French-Italian naval deal signed in October to build and export ships together. So are these signs of an inevitable rift between two very different leaders and visions for Europe? 
Or could the row be about scoring political points ahead of European Parliament elections in the spring? Sandra Gottman, The Newsmakers. Let's bring in our panel now. In Rome, we have Simone Pilon. He's a member of the Italian Parliament for the La Lega Party. In Johannesburg is Stefan Sakoschek. He's a representative of France's National Rally Party. And Jacques Rallon joins me from Saint Malo in northern France. He's a senior research fellow at the Global Policy Institute. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Jacques Rallon, let me start with you. So we had Salvini criticize the French. And then after that, the deputy prime minister of Italy, Luigi Di Maio, he goes, he hangs out with the Yellow Vests protesters. He takes pictures with them, says he met with the leadership. And then he tweets, the winds of change have crossed the Alps. Tell me just how fundamentally insulted the French were by that act. <laughs> insulted, yes, they felt a bit insulted, but I think they think it's more kind of play acting on the part of, uh, of Italy. Italy is now looking for a scapegoat. Italy is not going through a very good patch uh, since the uh, this government has taken over in uh, June, uh, the country has entered in recession, two quarters of uh, uh, re minus 0 0.2 and minus 0 0.1 for the GDP. So the situation is not too good. And in that case, you need to find a bogeyman. You need to find a scapegoat for your problem. It is nothing better than attacking France, especially as France is as... Uh, criticized this government from the start. Actually, Macron started it when in June he said that the populist leprosy had uh, arrived in uh, in Europe with the arrival of this uh, Salvini de Mayo government. Simone, is that what's happening? Your government is looking for a boogeyman and France is an easy target. This is noise and not substantial. Is that what's happening? Well, I believe uh, that uh, we are making uh, a new Europe. We have uh, to, to choose uh, a new way because uh, today Europe uh, is uh, only a, a sort of uh, uh, financial lobbies and uh, big companies uh, issue. And uh, we have to go to the roots of Europe. And the roots of Europe are in, the, in people, in uh, European peoples. And so uh, this is what, are, uh, what we are doing to do, we, what we are looking to do. Uh, we, we, we have to restart from uh, the beginning, uh, to restart from people, and not from populism, but from people, from people's needs, from people's uh, desires, from people's hearts, and uh, to do a new Europe with a soul, with a really soul, right. and not uh, without soul like uh, this one. Right. Simone, Emmanuel Macron has said... Italy deserves leaders worthy of its history. He doesn't respect your ruling coalition as worthy of leading the great nation of Italy. How do you feel about that? Well, I believe that uh, Italy and France uh, peoples are very, uh, very close and uh, are united from a, a, a very long time ago friendship. But, uh, but uh, the actual government in, in France uh, has, uh, has uh, made some mistakes. It doesn't start from people, but uh, prefer to start from, uh, from lobbies, from banks, uh, and from financial lobbies. And so the words of Mr. Macron uh, are understandable in this, uh, in this way. Uh, Mr. Salvini, our uh, deputy president, uh, and uh, Mr. Di Maio are saying this. Uh, right. uh, our, our, friendship, our friendship is with uh, uh, people of France, uh, but uh, Macron is not uh, um, giving a, a word to his own people. Understood. Let me bring in Stefan Sarkoschek here. So, Stefan, is this just noise ahead of EU elections with a tit-for-tat, tat, or is there something deeper? Are we seeing clear examples of EU progressives versus EU populist nationalists? Uh, I think we are. Thanks for having, uh, having me. I think we are, and I, I will join uh, Simone in his comments or support his comments. Uh, I think Italy's nation and France's nation are very, uh, very much friends and have been so for for decades and centuries um, in exchange of population back and forth. Uh, I think what we mustn't forget in my particular position, I represent the Rassemblement National, 
Um, I clearly didn't vote for Macron. Macron is clearly not my president. Um, that's one thing uh, which we have to take out of the equation. And I would take a, a much broader macroeconomic view or geopolitical view on mm -hmm. Europe uh, and its relation uh, with each individual member state. Um, and I think relative to Di Maio's comments on uh, on France being still a, you know, a, the ex-colonial master of Africa, we have to take an entirely different view on that as well. It can right. be, it, but it I mean, Stefan, with that ways. sort of so, stuff about the Italians saying France is the ex-colonial master of Africa and so on, I mean, the Italians have to have a lot of naivety and amnesia to even criticize the French over that because the Italians bungled it, right? It sounds as if they were jealous that France was so successful and so diabolical at their colonialism and the Italians screwed up in Libya and elsewhere. Perhaps some of that, perhaps some of that, but the historical ties, you know, we, we can't forever go back into, into uh, 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 the relations between France and, and Africa or the UK and Africa for that matter. We have to take, we have to be a bit progressive and take matters uh, forward, I would say. So right. they are almost non-comments. Okay, so, okay, that, this is interesting because, I mean, you brought it up and it was some of the more colorful stuff that we heard from the Italians about the French. So Jacques Reland, as we kind of categorize the comments, right? So we have direct support for the yellow vest protesters. This is, you know, a serious issue. On the ground, people protesting from various parts of society on the left, the right, and so on. It's very difficult to figure out who exactly they are and what they represent. Clearly, there's discontent. That's something real. But then there's the sort of flinging mud over the colonial history and stuff like that. How do we kind of pass through this and find what the Italians are serious about and what they're not. It's very difficult to know what they're serious about because it's very difficult to accuse uh, migrations from Africa uh, arriving in Europe uh, to accuse the French, French colonialism for that. It's a long time ago and uh, that fr France uh, has been uh, obviously a big colonial power and the France-Africa relationship has been very strong and sometimes you can say very could be very heavily criticized but France is no longer the main player in Africa you have countries such as China even Russia everyone wants to uh, uh, to be involved in Africa and let's not forget that this the migrants are not actually coming from French Africa uh, the Di Maio I think criticized France uh, because uh, said that they maintain colonialism through the colonial the the CFA the, the French uh, the, uh, the African French currency but this currency, which has been chosen by 14 countries, is actually not bad for the countries. And any country which doesn't want to belong to the France CFA uh, area can leave when they want. If they're not right. leaving, it's because right. there's economic integration in the area, ability to trade, international credibility. Simone, let's, let's bring you in here. Is yeah. your main problem with the French, their migration policy, or more that they are hypocritical about their migration policy, that they're actually quite tight on migration, but they like to preach to everybody else. Well, I believe that uh, the situation of immigration is uh, uh, really uh, and quite different uh, as uh, the one uh, who uh, media tells, uh, tell us. Uh, in first, uh, uh, at the first point, we have to, uh, to, to remember that uh, we are not in front of a common kind of migration, but it's a biblical kind of migration. So I believe that it's really a deportation, not a migration. This is the first issue. The second one is that it's very, it's very strange, if you remember, that Italy has to... Uh, to receive uh, all uh, uh, migrants uh, in his uh, own country and then uh, they have not uh, to go in Europe. They have to stay in Italy and uh, this is uh, the, the world of Europe uh, until uh, uh, 2018. Uh, now we are, mm, we are struggling for make a, a new way of migration and so uh, only, only legal migration, no illegal migration only legal migration and only if we are uh, uh, capable of, uh, of uh, 
uh, right. stay with, with uh, these people and uh, to prepare to, to them a, a job uh, or right. a, a, a hope, a future. It's not possible to, to do uh, like uh, we are doing uh, until now. And so, uh, for example, having a lot of people, young people, uh, we are making poor Africa because we are uh, deporting young people here in Europe without hope. Okay. This is not okay. possible. Okay. And, and so and, and, I mean, we're starting to that's, change. Th that's, that's the other side of this coin here on migration, right? It's very clear. And the two, there are two very fundamentally different visions about migration on the continent right now. And your government has a very specific one, which is, I guess, along the lines with Poland, with Hungary, and a few other countries. And we're seeing these fault lines develop over policy. Stefan, you're in this interesting position here because obviously you want your country, France, to do well, but you're closer to the Italians on this debate. The French see it as Italian ministers going um, on the ground in places like Paris as destabilizing or trying to destabilize France. To what extent would you accept that they are kind of, they're, they're making a bit of mischief and a bit of menace in your country? I think uh, I think France uh, hasn't waited for any for anyone uh, to to cause itself a, a bit of mischief and a bit of unrest. I think we have a we have the rise of a <clears throat> great discontent of a big chunk of the population. Um, I think it's a natural phenomenon uh, in France. I think it, France is very very democratic and probably and perhaps even over. So I don't think interference from any one of its friend uh, member states within the EU has anything to do with it. I think it has to do with ideology. And, uh, and and socio-economic positions on certain matters that are that right. are relevant. Uh, the bit of it, we obviously see uh, joining forces uh, with Italy and Austria and Hungary uh, to, to to establish a European parliamentary. Um, the opposition uh, is obviously going to use any event they can get their hands on to to say that uh, you know it's agitation and mischief. It's just uh, following the normal course of where of where the rest of Europe is going. Is that right. Europe as we knew it. And, and I must say, it, I was one of the first ones to sign the 1994 Maastricht Treaty, but Europe as we wanted it has, uh, has completely veered off the right track. Uh, yeah. We're sitting on a you know, 30,000 civil servant bureaucracy in Europe deciding who and what gets normalized. And now, right. now that they've run out of things to normalize, uh, they're trying to draft as many multilateral and bilateral treaties as they possibly can just to keep themselves busy. Right. Um, so I was mentioned earlier, we have to take a bird's eye view on, on the political uh, unrest at the moment in, in Western Europe, whether it's Italy or France, and really look at Europe's position uh, in, uh, in Africa and see who are the real beneficiaries behind, behind the current uh, setup. The political refugees and, uh, and asylum seekers are, you know, there's illegal, illegal immigrants we don't want. Uh, they are a consequence of Europe's aid to Africa for the, for the last 30 or 40 years. The direct beneficiaries right now are actually the Chinese. I can expand on that a bit later on. We want a selective process. We want Europe to be reconstructed. We want a selective process in our immigration. We want to be able to say, much like the Middle East or, or the United States or Asia, for that Understood. matter, we want to be able to choose who, who is... Uh, right. Yeah. And we're running out of time here. I want to get a final comment from Jacques here, right? Jacques, yeah. we're hearing that, you know, this is substantial. This is something to take seriously between Italy and France as it's ramped up over the past few months. But there's a view that when the EU elections pass, this will die down. Is that what's going to happen? It probably will die down after that. But at the same time, I would like to go back on this issue of migration, which is very important. Uh, migration is not biblical. The migration has stopped. It was, there was a huge amount of immigration. Over 1 million uh, arrived in 2015, and since then, the figures has been going down. Last year, there was less than 100,000 migrants coming. And among them, many were political refugees fleeing areas where they could not survive, uh, dictatorship, and so on. So, uh, and at the same time, yes, Europe has to accept political refugees. We have, there's an international conventions. We have to accept them. The big issue is about how to spread them. Quite a lot, quite a lot of, uh, of them arrive in, uh, in Italy now. It was 80% arrived through uh, the Mediterranean in Italy. The main problem is 
Europe is unable to decide on a common asylum policy totally, totally. and a reporting, reporting quotas. And that would be, that's the French idea, that when people, instead we have the Dublin Convention, people have to ask for asylum in the country where they arrive. And obviously, Italy has taken the brunt of it. But now Italy has gone too far right. by preventing boats from landing on its coast Certainly. and by Jacques, letting boats in the Mediterranean. Yeah, Jacques, I'm come. And, and of course, there was a big debate over Aquarius, which arguably started all of this, right? It's at the heart of the debate in Europe. Some feel that the policy is unfair, the bureaucrats in Brussels favour some countries over others, and so on. It's a question of fairness and a question of a differing vision for what Europe means. It's not going to go away anytime soon, especially with Brexit and other things, and we'll continue to cover it. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure having you on the Newsmakers, but I have to move on. Simone Pilon, Stefan Sakoschek, and Jacques Reland. thanks again. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. Check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. Next time, Greece's government is under investigation for wasting money meant for refugees. We investigate if officials knowingly let companies overcharge for millions of dollars. Until then, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.